So hello everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, just maybe making sure that we are live. If you can just type some comments on, on your Facebook feed, if you can hear me well, if you can see us, that would be uh, very helpful. And uh, yeah, otherwise we'll, let's take maybe two, three minutes to wait for more people to join and then we'll kick off this conversation. Again, hi everyone, thank you for joining. Uh, just if you can hear us well and see us well, put a little comment in there so we can we can see that everything is okay. And then we can start. Thank you. Great. Um, so maybe we start now. Uh, yeah. Ooh, very good. Thanks, Lara. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Masa al khair. Marhaba bikum. You welcome everyone. Thank you for uh, making the time to join this uh, evening conversation, uh, which we hope is going to be a, a nice one, a fruitful one uh, for 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 everyone. Um, uh, my name is Ismail Shayib. I'm a part of a, a global network called DAN, Digital Arabia Network. Uh, Digital Arabia Network is a, a community of uh, people in and around the middle, uh, the, the, the MENA region, so Middle East, North Africa, a, a community of people trying to, uh, trying to advance the digital transformation agenda in the region. And as, as part of this uh, agenda, we're hosting different uh, online conversations. And uh, today I'm, I'm very, very happy, very glad to, to host one such conversation on cybersecurity. So we'll, we'll spend the last, the next 60 minutes talking about cybersecurity. We're very privileged in that regard to have uh, Priscilla uh, Elora uh, Sharouk with us. Uh, Priscilla is a uh, COO a, at a, a very successful a cybersecurity company. We'll have uh, Priscilla. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, her company, what she does, but also share with us some of the views she has on this topic. So I'm I'm very very uh, sure it's going to be a rich conversation. Of course, these are um, these uh, conversations are meant to be interactive. So uh, we are uh, very much welcoming all of your contributions. So feel free to reach out to us through Facebook comments and, 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 and send us your questions. Uh, I'll, I'll be glad to, to, to share those questions with Priscilla and, and, and get her views on the subject. Uh, we're also very lucky today and fortunate to have uh, Rasha Hamde with us. Uh, Rasha is also on the, on the call and she will be doing the translation uh, to sign language, English to sign language. Uh, and she's doing the, the translation live. So hi, Rasha, thank you for, for your support. So um, 
that's very briefly for the uh, for the kind of housekeeping rules just to set just setting the context here um, let me maybe first before we start our conversation let me introduce you uh, a little further our speaker so again very very uh, happy and very very excited to ha to have her with uh, with us today so uh, priscilla El elora sharuk is the co-founder and coo as i said chief operating officer at uh, mikey which is a pa password manager and authentication company based in Berlin, uh, in, Be Berlin no, in Beirut, uh, Lebanon. Uh, it was awarded PC Mac coveted editor's choice 2020. Uh, it's a, uh, so the application, this Mikey password manager is recommended by uh, Firefox. So really kind of useful tool for your password management. Um, Priscilla herself, she's listed as a Forbes uh, top 10 women in tech in in mena in 2020 as well so uh not not every day that we have this uh, kind of conversations again very very pleased to have her with us she's a forbes top 100 business uh woman in the middle east in 2019 awarded the women's leader council impact award named game changer by the women's health magazine she has she has been featured in the wall street journal TechCrunch, entrepreneur and over 60 pub global publications so uh that is uh, Priscilla. Priscilla, thank you very much, so much for uh, that. That is, and I think there's a lot more uh, that we will be talking <laughs> about uh, about you. But thank you so much for being with us. We're very, very glad, very happy to have you with us today. Thank you for having me. Hi, Smail. Hi, Rasha, and hi to everybody who's here. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to have a warm chat with us. So I'm super excited. Thank you, Smail. Great. Uh, th th thanks, Priscilla. Right out of uh, out of the bat, maybe let's let's just jump into it. And why don't you start with sharing the kind of quick thirty second pitch for for Mikey? Like I, I talked a little bit about it, but maybe tell us a little bit more sure. about what is Mikey. Happy to. So Mikey is a password management solution that uh, was created to help you regain control of everything related to your digital identity. So for consumers, we allow you to download a password manager and use it to log into all of your accounts. For enterprises and managed service providers, we have a software that allows companies to manage where their team members access company accounts. Now, we set out to build MyKey to fix the password problem that was happening. You know, every single username, password, every single account, you know, it's, it's too much to handle for anybody. And don't forget the cloud was you know on the rise so the company was founded in 2015 but we understood very early on that while the cloud is great for a lot of things your passwords is not one of them so we opted for an offline password management solution it's got the security of offline but it allows your uh, credentials to sync across all your devices providing you with the convenience of online uh, the company has raised uh, a seed round of 1.2 million in 2016 and went on to raise the second round of 4.7 million. So that's a total 4.5, excuse me. And that's a total of $5.7 million uh, from three different investors, Beko Capital out of Dubai and Leap Ventures in Beirut and BNY Venture Partners in Beirut. So you listed some of the cool credentials that Mikey has gained over the past couple of years. To add to that, it's on Apple's list of most powerful password managers. It was on Forbes list of top 50 most funded companies in MENA. And everything that we do, our mission is to help users regain control of their digital identity by providing them with the tools to safeguard their information. I could keep talking forever about this, but I'm going to keep it short. <laughs> it's it's quite amazing, really, for sure. I mean, it's yeah. Con congrats for this, uh, for this journey. I'm pretty sure that it's you know what's coming is is even more exciting. But I I, I was wondering, like, well, what's your story? How how do you get to you know, being into this company or creating this company that raised, you know, multi-million rounds and so on. Like, well, tell us a little bit about your background and your story. I'd be happy to, you know, Smile, I call myself an accidental entrepreneur because it all happened by accident. And I never had the, this is the electricity that just cut. Welcome to Lebanon, everybody. So much for I the think accident. We're still, <laughs> <laughs> we're still connected and we're back, okay. Um, so we never had the intention to actually build a business. What we wanted to do was solve a problem that most people were suffering from, which is forgetting passwords. And that is why 
we started the journey of building Mikey, which essentially at the very beginning in about 2014, it was a hardware device. So it was a hardware device that you connect to your computer that allows you to log into your accounts without having to manually input any information. I come from a landscape architecture background. So a lot of people always ask me, um, you started with something and went into something else. So I read a lot about it and guess what, everybody? Uh, on average, you change your life or your career three times. So I'm in my second career change at this point. Started off as a landscape architect, did that for four years. I loved my profession, but my true passion has always been technology and going through different um, competitions and realizing that, hey, you're onto something. And this is the feedback that we got from different mentors. So I cannot reiterate enough to any hopeful entrepreneur that's listening to us, how important it is to go through acceleration, incubation programs, get your idea out there, get as much feedback as you can and compete. Because I think the biggest fear is, is when is it the right time to go and take this risk and, and go on this journey and to build something that you think is you know is is promising, and uh, I think Oops. getting so, that knowledge is what makes you more courageous to take that step. And and how do you know? I mean, I, I completely you know sort of relate and agree with you. But the question is, how do you know now is the right time? So I always say this: it's never the right time because as human beings, naturally, what we want to do is wait for all the cards to be on the table. We have mm -hmm. to have all the answers before we take that risk. It's never going to happen. The moment that you have something in your hand, and I think tip number one would be um, speak to mentors or people in the industry that most probably because of their experience, experience know more about this than you. And second of all, it's about uh, believing in what you can bring to the table and that's by educating yourself. So given that I don't come from a cybersecurity background specifically, I had to ask a lot of questions and do a lot of research and really eat, live, breathe this industry in order to feel more equipped. And more importantly, I had a team that helped me get there um, because my co-founder comes from this very industry. So we you know, almost created a cross-functional team Having these different skill sets allows us to see the problems from different aspects and to have different talents that we can bring to the table to push forward and make this vision come true. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. So, so landscape, ar landscape architecture, then you stumbled upon this idea, met with a technical co-founder, talked to different peoples, and then you said, okay, that's it, let's go. And then you went for it and it worked. I, yes, I quit my job and then it took a couple of months before we got the funding. So we went through acceleration and incubation program to get ourselves up to the level where we understand the process of what we're going through. You know, most of the companies that started out or ended up today as something completely different, like, for example, uh, Google was a search engine that started with library optimization. Mm -hmm. uh, YouTube started off as a dating app. So, you know, things don't always start out what they intend to be. Mikey started off as a hardware device and then turned into this full-fledged software for consumers and enterprises. So the idea here is, is to build with and around your market. Make sure that you're going out there, speaking to your market, understanding what it is that you're building, how it can make a difference. A lot of entrepreneurs like myself, we fall into the trap of, of thinking that this is what we are building today because this is what the market wants. Sometimes what you're selling, what, what your, excuse me, what your customer is buying is very different from what you thought you were selling. Mm. So it's really essential to speak to your market and build your product around them. Yeah, I see. Yeah. And I, I think for me also one of the question was, you know, and particularly because your background is sort of slightly different from that, why did you choose cybersecurity? And I know you talked about like, you know, kind of stumbling upon that, but is there are there any reasons why cybersecurity in particular? Cybersecurity chose me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a series of things, you know. Um a lot of times people within my sort of family or friends, different hacking incidents, different things mm -hmm. like that, that 
made us feel like the existing tools on the market aren't answering the problem in a way that is sustainable. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, why not build it yourself or at least try to build it yourself and take it from there. So again, um, sometimes I think that mo most of the successful companies, they, it comes from actually solving a problem that, you know, your surrounding suffers from. And uh, I think that's one of the key things when deciding whether or not you want to spend time and actually go into that venture. Yeah, no, no, totally. I, I, I can see that. And, you know, m maybe if we if we dig a little deeper into this topic of cybersecurity, and I know, you know, we, we talk a lot about it, um, but what do you think is the most important or the most urgent threat uh, in in terms of cybersecurity for our region, right? So for the for the Middle East and, and North African countries, right? And, and, and perhaps you can talk about that you know, through different lenses, yeah. like through the individual, like us, the citizens, but also the companies sure. and also maybe at the state level, what are the most pressing threats in your opinion? Absolutely. So it's really important to talk about cybersecurity on these different verticals because cybersecurity is everybody's business, whether mm. it's an individual or an SME, a big organization and even nations as a whole. And today, cyber attacks are on the rise. For example, a computer attack happens every 39 seconds. So you can imagine the domino effect today we've been on this call for a couple of minutes you can imagine potentially how many millions of devices and people could have been uh, affected by this and we're not just talking about businesses we're also talking about identity theft where people could potentially steal a person's personal information and sell it for, for profit etc and today technology is moving at a very fast rate and that's fantastic but better technology also means unfortunately, better ways to automate and generate cyber attacks. So cybersecurity importance is on the rise. And today, being more technological than ever means that being cyber aware is not an option. It's actually crucial. Uh, in terms of individuals, let's start there. There isn't enough cybersecurity awareness in the public domain in MENA. So today, individuals really need to understand the devices, the systems that they are using, and as states, we need to raise citizens' awareness of cybersecurity. And this needs to be built in from a young age or unfortunately, because it hasn't been in the same way that it has internationally, it needs to start now. And I, I guess it would be cool to jump in now and, and talk to, to everybody that, that's listening to us on some of the cybersecurity best practices that they could go through or that they could uh, execute in order to protect themselves online. So, for example, stop using weak and easy to guess passwords. Make sure that you use strong, complex alphanumerics that have letters and numbers and capital letters. And shameless plug, you can uh, <laughs> download the Mikey app and it has a password generator that can do that for you. Use different passwords across your accounts because if one of your accounts is hacked, all of your accounts are hacked. Another one would be use two-factor authentication, which is the extra layer of security. It's that token or that uh, four-digit code, five-digit code that you receive by SMS or by email. Don't store sensitive information online in your browsers and be aware and vigilant. I think this is the number one thing. I left it for last, but it's really the number one thing. Be aware. A Nigerian prince does not need your money and a Nigerian prince doesn't want to give you all their money. So if it looks fishy, then it is fishy. So make sure you don't press any links that you receive via email. Um, don't, you know, don't email somebody your personal information, your credit card information, etc. And in a nutshell, browse the internet safely. Make sure you see a little lock next to the URL to make sure that your data isn't being taken away. Um, that's on the individual side. Uh, let's move on to, you know, a, a little bit like zoom may out. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe just on, on that, on the individual side thing, I, I think one of the tensions that I see me in, maybe in my work, but also in my personal life is, you know, there is always this tension between having good security and having good user experience, right? And, and sometimes, or most of the times, they are not you know, they are um, like one is against the other. So I'm, I'm just like kind of wondering how how do you, yeah, like how do you, so like an, an example of that is two-factor of authentication. Two-factor of yeah. authentication basically is when you get an SMS or second factor, 
plus your password. Very good right. security, kind of cumbersome to use. So like, what, what's your, you know, what's your message or what do you say to people who would tell you, yeah, I know it's more secure, but it's not convenient. You know, like how, how do we deal with this right. convenience versus security? You know, Smile, it's like you're, you're pushing me always in the direction where I can talk about my key and I love it because <laughs> the fact that we don't store data in the cloud as my key allows us to also automate your two factor, which means that you won't have to feel the stress of having to use an additional two-factor authenticator, but it's actually embedded in my key. So my key will put in your username, your password, the 2FA that arrives and log you in hands-free. So yes, this is a tool that we created and we always say security and convenience. These are the two themes of why we build the product that we built. And I think these are the two themes that need to be the biggest themes for any company that's trying to protect individuals that are uh, online and uh, you know using their credentials to log into anything. So 2FA can be cumbersome, but, but with the right tool, it becomes very easy. And, and to everybody listening, it really is essential. You need to have a second factor, especially if you're using a weak password. Um, at least having that second barrier, it's like having two different locks on your door. The first one, somebody tries to break through the first one, at least they have a second barrier they need to break through, which is usually connected to your phone and you have full access to it. So you can make sure that nobody can actually take that second token. No, that's clear. So your, your point is, you know, convenience doesn't necessarily trumps or is not, um, you know, the enemy of security, but they can they can work harmoniously provided some technology, right? For it instance. has been. Yes, exactly. It has been. Convenience has been the enemy of security and adoption of security for a long time. Yeah. But with the right tool, the user interface and experience, uh, we just today it's about selling convenience. Mm -hmm. You sell convenience and you're secure. It's like the Tesla model. Tesla uh, built a beautiful car and sold you a beautiful car. And hey, it's good for the environment as well, right? Mm -hmm. So they sold you the beauty and not the environmental factor of it. Because if you came and sold me something that's specifically related to an environmental change, I might not necessarily be into it. But the fact that it looks great and also helps the environment, that's fantastic. So sell convenience before you sell security. Okay, good point, good point. So let's move on to the other threats. Like what, again, what's the most yes. threats maybe on companies now? Yes, let's talk about companies. So the growing use of, uh, of the mo of mobile internet in MENA and especially the increase of e-commerce sales. So mm -hmm. this has been one of the most major target for cyber criminals. Um, cyber criminals are targeting entities that deal with money due to certain gaps in these security systems. Private companies in MENA need to in, be incentivized, incentivized by the state to have a holistic strategy for cybersecurity in order to guarantee compliance, to have harder consequences for breaches, as well as setting financial incentives such as, for example, tax returns. This will allow us as a region to become more uh, proactive as opposed to reactive, because today we are more reactive. Today we are faced with an issue, we try to solve it. But if we are aware of the threats that exist, it becomes a lot easier as a company um, to deal with these things. Now, financial institutions in MENA uh, have been sort of researched and said to be behind on their implementations of effective uh, you know, data security measures. And although there are policies uh, that have been set by international standards, it's still, uh, it's still one of those things that is thought about in second place. If you think about the concept of any medicine needs to be FDA approved, mm -hmm. any restaurant needs to have an ISO certification. And I think in the same manner, any company that is dealing with data, which we can discuss a little bit later in terms of this, but any, any company that is dealing with data also needs to have different policies and procedures in place or some sort of certification because it has become truly essential in the day and age. I mean, think about COVID, uh, Smile today. Every single company with work from home and remote work mechanisms and all of this, everybody's accessing company data from outside of the company infrastructure. And that's one of the most dangerous things for any company or institution. So having the certain laws in place 
And again, I'm going to plug my key, but it's just because we've worked really hard on making sure that uh, we have we are compliant with these different protocols to ensure that using our product will ensure the data safety and security of you and your uh, uh, your team and your uh, customers as well. So, so I mean, talking about you know, let, let's take an example. You know, someone may be listening um, today on the show and. They have like an SME somewhere in, I don't know, Lebanon, Jordan. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they, they have a small business. They have maybe a website. What, what, what would you, what would be your recommendation? I'm sure the recommendation you said for individuals, they still hold, but is there mm -hmm. something more specific? Is there a certain certification they would be looking at or trainings or something like that? So I think there are a lot of trainings and those are things that can I can uh, additionally, maybe we can share some sort of documentation with the listeners. If we find a little bit of interest, I'm happy to share some links. There are trainings that help you train your team against phishing attacks. Mm. A phishing attack would be uh, you as the CEO of your company. Um, it just looks like you've sent an email to someone on your team to pass you something that is a sensitive piece of information, but actually it's not coming from someone on your team. Um, Mikey for enterprise, and this is for companies. Today, we need to put company administrators back in control of company data. Let's take a very simple example. As a company, you have a social media team. This social media team has access to your Twitter, your Facebook, your Instagram. Um, you have two or three people that have access to these passwords. Can you imagine the risk if any of these people were to leave your company? how much you could jeopardize uh, mm. the safety and security of your data and information. And this is on the smallest scale. I'm just talking about a social media platform. But if you're using a password manager, it allows you to give your team access to these accounts without actually revealing the password. So they have access without having the information that can compromise it. A lot of people think a hack happens because of some Russian hacker uh, sitting in the dark, wearing a hoodie and, and sitting on his laptop. But effectively, Sam in accounting, sorry, Sam, I don't know who you are, but apparently you're in accounting today. Sam in accounting just used the same weak password on a corporate account that he used on his personal account. And now his personal info is breached and your company data, your client's data is now all in the wrong hands. So it's really important for companies to safeguard their information and the information of the, everybody that they work with. Okay. Pretty clear. And so let, let's move to the last lens and to, to talk about states and, and cybersecurity and their threats and what should they do about it. Now, we are in a region where the growing threat of cyber attacks and cyber crime is linked to two things. First of all, Internet of Things or everything that is connected to the Internet, like your smartwatch, your smart fridge, your smart lock any of these things. There are a lot of vulnerabilities when it comes to that. So that's on one side. But we also cannot dissociate cybersecurity from geopolitics, especially in MENA, where cyber conflict is just one of the symptoms of a larger, wider political tension. I'll give you an example from that is close to home, basically, from Lebanon with the October 17th revolution. Some of the biggest victims to cyber attack were the Instagram activists during a time where local media was in what we call the blackout and not really portraying what was happening on the streets and Instagram activists were going up and saying, hey, we're on the ground. This is what's happening. A lot of these attacks were a lot of these accounts were prone to cyber attack and MENA countries need to develop a solid and sustainable national digital security strategy and data protection laws in order to be able to track down people that are conducting these attacks and to put in certain procedures, to put in certain protocols. The state needs to be training its personnel, much like private companies need to be training their personnel. And I think um, this level of training will, it all comes down to ethics, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, Smaid, but at the end of the day, you cannot dissociate cyber attacks from the geopolitical tensions or even, you know, tensions within the different countries. Everything you do is online. Today, your online identity, more than ever with COVID and all of this that's happening in the world, your online identity is almost as true as your identity. So it's one of the things you need to safeguard the most. Yeah. 
I, I see what you mean. And, and I also see kind of the risks of, of uh, um, certain, certain actions from the government. I mean, you, you, you were talking about, um, you know, Lebanon and how, how you had all these online kind of harassment campaign. Actually, I can definitely relate to that. In Algeria, we had very similar, uh, similar campaigns where whenever there were some kind of leader of the popular movement, the Hirak, uh, last year, they were kind of systematically, you know, har harassed online and, and so on. And now what happened is there was a law which was meant to kind of fight fake news, but mm -hmm. which in reality, it's actually being used to, to take those same, um, you know, like, how do you say, opposition leaders and to put them right. into play. So, right. I, th I think there's definitely a discussion to be had there around ethics, um, but uh, I, de I definitely see there is a risk, you know, like that the, the government using the cyber security motive to actually put mm -hmm. more restrictions on our societies. Do you, would, would, would you agree with that? Absolutely, yeah. What we're seeing today is, these, is the usage of these large, unregulated open environments or platforms, right? That are meant to empower people, but this is leading to disinformation uh, moving very rapidly and across the globe. Mm -hmm. um, you'll notice that the Apple store within the COVID pandemic um, refused to have any uploads of Corona related mm -hmm. applications. So here you ask yourself, when you control the information, does it make it right? or wrong and again it falls down to the concept of ethics and it's become so easy to spread misinformation for example uh, on twitter during the last u.s election somebody tweeted and said we've just shredded a box of republican uh mail-in ballots and this was in kentucky and this tweet led to an escalation of thousands of bots and automated accounts circulating screenshots with a hashtag called stop the steal and this this information it grew from beyond an allegation of a shredded ballot to the elections are rigged and this caused a huge international scene, right? So again, these unregulated open environments given or put in the right, in the wrong hands, excuse me, at the end of the day, that's what it comes down to. Behind every single device is a human being. And this is where you need to decide, do you, what are your goals and your values made of? And what are you going to use your voice for? And again, this is the concept of white hackers versus white hat hackers or black hat hackers. So again, ethics sits at the base of everything related to, to this kind of, um, these nuances of everything that we do online. So today it's the concept of fake news, spreading disinformation, how do you stop it? And if you do stop it and control what people say, does it make it right? Does it mean that what you are spreading is the right thing? Yeah. It's a very fine line. Yeah, and I think the question also is how do you stop it? But maybe to me personally, the, the important question is how do I um, sort of protect myself against that, right? Like, and, and as you said, now these fake news or these uh, campaigns are so sophisticated it's it's no mm -hmm. longer the prince from nigeria who wants to give you 10 millions right like, <laughs> like things that are has a little bit of a truth in it and and then wrapped into uh this uh, the, 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 this whole kind of you know it kind of a weaponization of information so yes yeah, so i guess my question to you is how do you think one can protect itself you know from from all these fake news around us I think it's verification of your sources at the end of the day. And this goes away from like the, the online sphere into really how you are in a day-to-day -day life. You know, a lot of people gossip about things and you hear about them. Will you replicate this and go and share it with someone else or will you check your sources first? Again, it's these open, unregulated environments. I think people are, thanks to Trump and his fake news hashtag, it really has, maybe that's the one good thing he did there, is uh, really make people aware of, of, you know, how fake news can get into the world. So make sure you check your sources at the end of the day, because again, a human being is behind it. And when it's controlled by all these bots that's spreading out this disinformation, it looks like there's a massive opinion related to this, but it doesn't necessarily have to be right because it's auto-generated and it's not real. So um, make the right calls. Um, you know, lead ethically and be correct and success will be your ally and you will get the information that you need. Mm. Cool. Good.
Um, let's maybe talk. I mean, this is obviously there's a lot to say around this this topic, and let me maybe pick on something you you've said a little earlier. And you, you were talking about um, data privacy laws in mm -hmm. the, the the MENA region countries. So, right? Can you maybe? Talk a little bit more about that. So I guess number one, what is what do you mean by a data privacy law? And then number two, sure. is that something that we need? And you know, how how would it look like? Sure. So um, what I was referencing is uh, the GDPR in Europe, which is the General Data Protection Regulation. It is a security law that was drafted and passed by the EU to impose certain obligations onto any organization that deals with collecting data about people in the EU. So any company that deals with people's information needs to take care of how it um, monitors or uses this information. What GDPR does um, is that it imposes harsh fines against those who violate privacy. And um, it has certain security standards and certain penalties that can be up to millions of euros. So the MENA region needs to put in place a law such as GDPR. And this would, and, and not only um, locally, I'm saying again, me now regionally, because this would allow us to harmonize uh, how things are happening across member states or across different geographies, help us learn from these uh, examples of putting this rule together. So almost every single organization that you think about, 99.9%, .9 I wanna say, deals with either customer data or employee data especially now again COVID-19 work from home everyone's accessing company data from outside a secured environment so a protection law like this is definitely a catalyst to new data management structures to safer employees and teams to safer uh, partners and other companies that work with you a lot of people say say the following thing they say I have nothing to hide mm -hmm. I have nothing to hide well, then remind me not to share any of my secrets with you, because if your machine is compromised, my, my, all of my information is compromised. So putting in rules and regulations, again, we, again, I mentioned this earlier, you think about the FNB industry and ISO certifications or FDA approvals in the pharmaceutical industry. We also need uh, certifications, rules, regulations that are put in place to protect companies, their teams, and every single customer that is dealing with this company and providing any private data, any payment uh, information, anything that is considered part of your digital identity, basically. And do, do you think we can dream of uh, such a data privacy policy, which is harmonized across the, the MENA region countries? I mean, hopefully it would definitely be a lot easier if you had a couple of people putting it together than to rely on every single state that is dealing with its own uh, issues to, to do that. But if it were put together um, and uh, again, the state incentivizes the people to use it, then I don't see why this, uh, this wouldn't actually be a very, very positive thing for us. And I think it's a necessity again. Mm -hmm. I think it's a necessity. Cool. Let, let's maybe talk. Take some questions from uh, from the Facebook feed. And again, to all our friends who are uh, watching us live, feel free to put your uh, questions for uh, Priscilla. We'd be happy to uh, take some of those. Um, so, okay. One one of the participants is saying, "I do not feel like I have much control over my data anymore." Even if I secure my data, there are lots of data that I have no control over securing. Uh, we are walking data protection as being. I even bought this DNA heritage test once, but I backed up and did not use it. How much control can we really actually have? Well, what do you think about that? I, I, I think it's a really interesting question. First of all, I'm really happy you didn't use that DNA thing. So <laughs> good call on that. Um, I think that in order for us, there we cannot control everything that's very true but you have a good head on your shoulders and you can make the right decisions for yourself so the fact that you chose and opted out of using that dna kit it shows that you truly understand that sometimes your data is not used in the right direction this is a big reason why the gdpr law was put in place to make companies force themselves to ensure 
to the customer in that case that they will not utilize your data for the wrong reasons. They will store it in the right place. They will not, uh, you know, there are certain factors that go into it. So yes, we cannot be secure, but we can do our best to protect ourselves by being aware of good cybersecurity hygiene and good um, uh, cybersecurity practices online. I think we lost Ismail. He seems a little bit frozen. Okay, so maybe I'll talk a little bit about, uh, I mentioned digital identity. So maybe I can talk a little bit about uh, what digital identity is and why you need to protect it. Um, this is something that I really wanted to, to put into place. I notice uh, uh, we've lost Ismail for a second, so we'll give him yeah. time to get back into the call. I'll back um, up as my till you till he uh, comes back to Celaya or so. Uh, okay, sure, sure, sure. I was going to no, talk to the audience a little bit about digital identity. Yes. Okay. So your digital identity is the body of information about you that exists online. So it comprises of your unique identifiers and it uses patterns to uh, make it possible to detect who you are. So simply put, is your digital identity is your equivalent to your real identity online, which includes your usernames, your passwords, your date of birth, your credit card information, your social security, and even your online uh, search activity and history. And if you believe that uh, you should be in control of your phone, your wallet, your keys, and your passports, and your credit card, which I'm sure you do, then you should also be in control of your digital identity. Um, and how can you protect it? So to everybody that's asking on the group about how safe are we? How can we be more safe? Um, use a trustworthy password manager and authenticator. Uh, try not to use any unprotected websites. Make sure that you don't use unprotected Wi-Fi networks. And if you have to use an unprotected Wi-Fi network, use a VPN. Update your software on all your system regularly. And this is essential because um, um, what developers will do is consistently make sure that this software is secured properly. And um, again, make sure that you, if you are a company owner and if you have a team, make sure you provide training to your employees of the best practices out there. And again, uh, maybe after the call, may, we'll see how we can share a couple of good trainings with everybody in case you are interested. So I wanted to share with you how to protect your digital identity and what it is. Because again, especially in the world we live in today, everything we do is online. So you really need to uh, protect your online accounts and uh, make sure that you are in full control of that. Um, this is great. And, and uh, does your company uh, implement these trainings? Because raising awareness, I think, about this topic is a very, very important. Hi, our moderator is back. That's great. Hey, but Smile, how... welcome back. <laughs> No, How sorry. do you raise Are you awareness? awareness? <laughs> <laughs> sorry for the delay. No problem. Um, I'm no just worries. asking as my Priscilla about the point of how to raise awareness. She talked about the digital identity and how yeah. to protect it. And she she wants to share with us maybe after the, the talk some of the trainings they are conducting. But how do you do you combine uh, conducting training and raising awareness? You have to so many target groups, you know, companies, individuals, and so on. And, and we think at them that the level of, um, of awareness about this very, very important topic, cybersecurity, is still in the MENA re region very, very important. Absolutely. So as a company, we don't provide specific training, but I do have a couple of outsourced tools that I think are fantastic that I'd be happy to share with the audience. And I think raising awareness is things like uh, getting up and speaking about it the way we are uh, today. So thank you to, to the Digital Arabia Network for allowing us to spread the word about the importance of uh, cybersecurity and of safeguarding your digital identity. Cool. All right, C can you hear me okay now? Yes, Mai, we awesome. can hear you. Okay, cool. All right. Well, I, I, I start, sorry again for for the uh, for the interruption, uh, but 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 I'm back. Um, okay. Th thanks, thanks, Priscilla, for for this clarification. I think one of the if we if we want to take another question um, that 
someone was asking, it was a little bit related to that ar around the point of um, uh, around the point of training, but more specifically around tr trustworthiness. So, say you're an entrepreneur, and uh, you know you want to build trust in your or you want your uh, customers to trust you. So, what what are the steps that you can take to to do that? And that's a question from uh, Mariam, I believe. Um, if you're trying to build trust as an entrepreneur that's building a tool, if, uh, for example, you have any uh, payment portal connected to your platform, make sure that you opt for a payment platform that is accredited and uh, um, that people know about, because this will help instill faith in people that are uh, purchasing on your website or on your platform. Another one would be to be open about your uh, about the feedback that you get or the customer reviews, because this helps people see that you, there, you have nothing to hide and that anytime you get any sort of customer review, it's addressed widely and openly and in all um, transparency. So I think as a company, given that I'm not sure which industry Mariam is in, but if she's selling a product, having a good payment portal in place that gives people security and makes them feel like they can use this payment portal is key. And second of all, being open in uh, their communication as a company when it comes to both positive and negative feedback will create that feeling of uh, trust with a potential customer. And Priscilla, may, may, maybe building on that, and I know you advise a lot, a lot, like maybe 300 or so startups you've been, and entrepreneurs you've been working with and advising, mentoring. I'm very curious, what, what's your, what's the sort of the advice that you give them, which pertains, which relates to cybersecurity, right? Like what's the cybersecurity hat experts is telling these young entrepreneurs? <laughs> so when, I, when I'm speaking to these startups, usually it's uh, helping them on their journey, building their company. So giving them advice on their pitch or on their anchor clients or on their user experience and their software. But when it comes to cybersecurity, um, you have to start your good cybersecurity hygiene when you are two people in your startup. It becomes so much more difficult to bring in anything to use as a company the more you grow. So really, start from when you are young, put in a team password manager, learn the good practices. It will become so much easier to roll out. And as you scale locally, regionally, globally, at least you know that you are protecting every single element that is key to the growth of your company. Because if you're not protecting your CRM, you have a problem. If you're mm -hmm. not protecting your social media, uh, the access to your social media, again, you have another problem. So cybersecurity, start with the good practices while you are very young. But I do give them a lot of tips that, have, that are on the non-security related side, and I'd love to share them with some of the listeners we have on today. Sure. Um, one of them is funding takes a lot of time. So um, start fundraising yesterday mm -hmm. and understand that there's a big due diligence process and make sure that if you're fundraising, you're fundraising for an ample amount of time, at least 12 to 16 to 18 months. You know, Anybody who says, yes, I'm going to fundraise for the next five or six months, by the time you close your eyes, open your eyes again, it's time to go through the fundraising experiment mm -hmm. and it's a long process. Um, two, you can never have all the answers. So if you're waiting for that, uh, you know, shining star to start your company, start from where you are, just do it, take that risk. Um, three, all criticism is constructive. Don't take it personal. Get out there, talk to as many people as you can. It's really not personal. Uh, get that feedback and use it to push yourself forward. Um, last but not least, or is it last? You cannot improve what you cannot measure. So mm -hmm. make sure that from the beginning, you are tracking your progress, set a goal, try to attain it, and make sure next time you know how to do it faster and even better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so I, I think, you know, following up on that, I might have like two questions. What, what do you think are the key metrics, maybe the, you know, one, two key metrics at the beginning of, of that journey? And, uh, and this, my second question would be, you, in your personal experience, what was the most difficult to do when, when you started? So the metrics would have 
have to depend specifically on the industry in which the startup is operating. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's number of partners, sometimes it's number of downloads, sometimes it's number of testers for the app. So it genuinely depends, but make sure that you choose the metrics that make the most sense for the industry that you are operating within. For us, um, a challenge for sure was starting off building a cybersecurity company and people saying, how do I know it's safe? Mm. And this is where you quickly understand that uh, you need to zoom out and you need to get the seal of approval from uh, people that are within the industry by giving them full visibility on what you are doing. Mm -hmm. Do not be afraid to share what you are doing. And if you're gonna say, I'm scared somebody's gonna steal my idea. If your idea is that easy to steal, then you probably shouldn't be doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that's, um, that's fair, fair enough. Um, yeah, fair enough. And, and maybe continuing on this kind of thread of, of uh, advice for young entrepreneurs, like what, what's, what's the one advice or few advice that you, you wish you knew when you started? You, you wish someone told you, you know, when you, when you started? I have so many things to say, Smail, but um, I wish somebody would have told me to trust the process. Uh, I think as entrepreneurs, sometimes we are naive optimists and we are just so zoomed in on our baby, which is our product and what we are building. And uh, we forget that it, it takes a while for you to get a, an investor on board, a customer on board, sometimes even the acceptance of your family members of what you are doing, mm. quitting your job and taking a risk. You got to trust the process. And sometimes these struggles, you don't know what they're preparing you for, but just trust that they are preparing you for something in the future and that you will look back and say, okay, mm -hmm. it was worth it. It was a whirlwind, but every single struggle that you are going to face, you will see that within, you know, a couple of months, a couple of years, you're going to look back and realize that taught me something that made me who I am or helped me push through that obstacle. What, what was the last thing where you said, you know, just that, oh my God, I did this and that taught me this. My life is a series of, <laughs> <laughs> I can't say that on camera, but uh, you know, nobody, nobody prepares you for this kind of, uh, the co-founder position. You can't, as much as you read about it, it's the day-to-day. -day. And uh, it's, it's not all fun and games. And a lot of it is being confident enough to admit that you don't know sometimes mm -hmm. and asking people for help. And honestly, with every single startup ecosystem around the region uh, that I've been a part of, whether through mentorship or through events or through competitions, we have a very, very warm uh, group of people. Entrepreneurs are extremely warm, especially in our region, and everybody's willing to help. So if you have a question, and, and I'm an open book like that too. So to everybody listening, that is a, you know, a, a hopeful entrepreneur that has an idea, is not sure where to go about it, reach out to me. I'm happy to help. I'm happy to guide as much as I can. And uh, you know, I think that's one of the key things is is it is up to us to push our startup ecosystems forward because entrepreneurs are the future of the global economy. And we are the ones that are gonna build the products of the future mm -hmm. to truly make a difference. Yeah, no, totally agree. And I, I think, you know, we're, we're probably going to, to, to close soon. And one of the question I really wanted to ask is around, you know, you're obviously a global company with a, a global uh, sort of footprint and customers, but you run the company, you're based in Beirut. So how, how does it feel like to run a global brand, global company, for, you know, in, in from Beirut and, and all that? Like, can, can you maybe tell us a little bit about that experience? Yeah, sure. Um, today, yes, Mikey was founded in Beirut, but we've scaled our offices to the US and to the UK. We have a team of over 40 people that service over a million customers in 172 countries. It's been a whirlwind. I don't even know how I'm here or still surviving, but I am, I have to say very grateful for the team that we have in place because it truly is a team effort. 
And um, I always say, even if you have the best product in the world, if you can't sell it, then you might as well stay home. So we have our amazing engineers that have built a fantastic product, but without our sales team, then the engine, then the sales, without our sales team, the engineers cannot push what they have created into the hands of our customers and the sales without an amazing engineering team. So I think it's all about um, keeping the ship well oiled, making sure that everyone is uh, motivated. And we are lucky that we have had so many people that joined our vision and helped us to, to, to make Mikey global and make it a reality. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks. And maybe, maybe on, on that note, like, you know, maybe one last question for someone who's a student and just getting out of university, what would be your, um, you know, sort of message to them or what sort of jobs they should be looking at, or, you know, what, where they should be put their interests, you know, what's the next big thing and what would you like right. to tell them? I'm gonna be very realistic when I answer this question due to the uh, unique uh, state in which the global economy is going through. Jobs are, you know, today have become very competitive. And I think that one of the top tips that I can give to anyone graduating from any uh, university vertical or degree is build complementary skills for yourself build parallel skills. So if you are a developer, take a digital marketing course, because when you go and apply to that job in a very competitive market, what's gonna happen is they're gonna look at your CV and see, okay, this is a developer with X many years of experience, or this is their degree, but they can also do this. We are interested in people that are tinkerers, that are curious, and that are multifaceted at skills, as skill sets. Today, startups that are funded will start by hiring generalists and slowly hire more and more specialists. So in order to secure yourself a spot and to secure yourself a job within a, especially an up and coming company, a startup, anything in tech, build complementary skills for yourselves, get those certifications, do different courses online. They are free, they are available, you know, keep educating yourself because unfortunately, uh, the job market is a very difficult one, but with the right complementary skills, you can become an even more attractive candidate for that job. Okay, cool. No, that's uh, that's perfect. That's a great way to, I think, to close this conversation. Uh, Priscilla, thank you so much for, for this thank very you, I think, rich thank you, conversation. You know, we, we tackled a lot of stuff uh, and you, you, brought, uh, you brought light, you brought new information uh thank you so much yeah i think and I, I i can see the comments and yeah there, there's lots of love and thank yous which are passing through the facebook uh, feed so uh yeah so thank you I, I don't know if you like maybe my last question to you and promise this is the last like where can we find <laughs> about you where can we connect with you on online so you can connect with me on linkedin at priscilla and laura sharuk to all the entrepreneurs uh, to everybody that wants to see what we're up to as a company we're at mikey security i'm at priscilla and laura on instagram and to everybody listening uh, to all the entrepreneurs especially i want to say we're living in very difficult times uh, don't give up keep pushing we are the future of this economy and we're not going to let uh, we're not going to let this stop us. So much love to everybody. Thank you, Smail. And uh, thank you, Resha, so much. And I wish you all a wonderful evening, afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Thank you, Priscilla. And uh, thank you to everyone, to all the listeners, the viewers. Thanks, Rasha, for the translation. It was, it was amazing. And uh, yeah, we just want to say a uh, big, big love from the Dan community. You can find us on Facebook, but also on the on the web. So Digital Arabia Network, make sure to check us on Facebook. We have a bunch of conferences and events on cybersecurity coming up and workshops coming up. So you'll have a little bit more information if you want to go deeper. That's it for us. It was Ismail and Priscilla and Rasha. Thank you, everyone. And we speak soon. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.